Thank you, Randy. Well, I've entitled the message this morning, Doing the Unexpected, uh, because uh, Jesus did that a lot. People were always astonished at the various things he did and the things he said. And God still works that way. He does unexpected things in our lives. He does unexpected things around us. And one of the reasons uh, these things are so unexpected is we don't really understand God. We don't live on the same wavelengths that God lives on. In fact, the prophet Isaiah uh, tells us uh, in his book, uh, chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, he says that uh, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways, he's talking to us, are not my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. So the challenge for us as we live the Christian life is to try to bring our thoughts into sync with God's thoughts so that our ways will come into sync with God's ways. And hopefully, as we mature, as we, we ingest more and more of God's Word into our, our hearts and our minds, we do begin to think more like God, and our ways do begin to become more like His. However, there is still that great gulf. And so He will still be doing things that are totally unexpected by us. And that is probably a good thing. We, no, we noted last week a little phrase that I, I hope got into your, your memory banks and that is that uh, people are more important than protocol. Right? People are more important than protocol. I hope we memorize that as we go through the book of, through the book of Mark. Uh, though Jesus didn't come out and say that, he certainly demonstrates that in his life, doesn't he? People are more important than protocol. Now that's very difficult for me. Because I've taken all the personality tests and all that, and uh, all of them say, for one thing, I'm an extreme introvert, but they also say that as far as uh, career choices and that, I should be like a, a school principal or the, the head of a, some, what, whatever, a museum, something that requires the same thing going on over and over again. So here I am. And you can decide what it is I'm actually presiding over. Uh, but I tend to really honor protocol in my life if I don't stop and think about it. I will put protocol ahead of people by default. That's the way I'm wired. So I have to then know that God's ways are people above protocol. So I have to bring Daryl's ways of protocol over people in line with God's because he's not going to come in line with mine. So as I mature, as I continue in my Christian life, I am getting better and better about putting people first. But it's still difficult for me. So pray for me that I can do that. Jesus now continues his ministry. And he's demonstrating his power over the spirit world and over the physical world. We saw that last week. Now he continues this week and he's going to demonstrate his power over both physical illness and sin. Okay. Now last week he demonstrated his power over physical illness. You remember the leper? And over the spiritual world, right? Remember the de demonic man? Or he cast the demon out of him. This week he's going to heal a paralytic and he's going to forgive his sins. Randy read the story for us. So let's examine it a little more, just a little more closely. The first couple of verses. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. We see here that Jesus had just returned from a very exhausting ministry tour. We know it was a very exhausting ministry tour because we see all these people have followed him home. And they're clamoring for him to tell them more, for him to meet this need or that need, whatever it is. And he is uh, most likely quite exhausted. In fact, 
Uh, I would say the last thing Jesus wants to do is deal with more people. Now, if you've ever been in a people business, and you know, where you've just been inundated with people for days and days, wanting you to do this, wanting you to do that, and you've been giving and giving and giving, you, you get exhausted. You get drained, and the last thing you want to do is hear somebody else tell you about their problems. Especially when they're going to expect you to fix their problems. Now Jesus, while being fully God, was also fully human. And so, he gets tired. We saw that when he was tested, didn't we, for the 40 days out there in the wilderness. He's exhausted, and the last thing he wants to do is deal with these people. But look at the last sentence in that second verse. And he was preaching the word to them. Somehow he reached down and got the energy because he had the compassion to try to meet these people's needs. He didn't shut the door, he didn't shut them out, but he stepped up and tried to meet their needs. The people are more important to him than the protocol that he needed, which was rest at the time. For Jesus, people are more important than comfort. Now, these people had legitimate needs. And Jesus was going to meet them. But our story now begins to narrow and focus. And it focuses on a particular group of men. Verses 3 and 4. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Now, this is typical Mark stuff. He doesn't tell us anything about these men. He doesn't really tell us anything about this paralytic other than he's paralyzed. And all of a sudden, they just show up. As we've learned to expect from Mark, there is very little detail. I mean, why are these men here? Why is the paralytic here? Well, that's rather obvious, but, but where did he come from? How did he hear about Jesus? Whose idea was it for him to come to Jesus? Was it his idea and then he gathered up four friends to bring him? Or did the four friends know about Jesus and come to him and say, hey, we know a guy that can meet your need? And take we don't know, do we? And the reason I think we don't know is because Mark's main thing here is focus on Jesus. Not on all the details, though they're very interesting, and I, I think in a lot of cases instructive. The main thing here is the main thing. It's Jesus and his ability to heal and to overcome uh, circumstances that seem impossible. One thing I think we can take away, though, also here is the paralytic could not have gotten to Jesus by himself. Now that's very important because we have so many Christians out there today that are trying to live their Christian lives by themselves. They don't have time for a small group. They don't have time to uh, gather a, a a little entourage of, of close friends that can help them and advise them and so to speak when they get paralyzed carry them to Jesus. So you know sometimes we get paralyzed in our Christian walk you know, and we just we just kind of lock up and we don't know what to do we don't know where to go and it's at those times we need some people that are close enough to us personally that they can say hey we're going to carry you to Jesus. Now, that may not look like putting you on a stretcher and physically carrying you somewhere. It may look like just gathering around and praying for you, supporting you, advising you, uh, maybe taking care of some uh, needs you might have, but getting you through this rough spot. We need that. So however it came about, this paralytic had four guys that cared about him enough to take him to Jesus. Now, I want you to notice, getting this guy to Jesus isn't easy. 
And when you are trying to help a fellow Christian that is somehow stymied in their faith, it's not easy. It can be very difficult. It can be very frustrating. It can take a long time. You have to be dedicated to doing that. Now when I say it's not easy, they carried this guy, four guys carrying one guy, that's probably not a big deal, but we don't know how far he, they carried him, do we? Did he live next door? Or did he live 100 miles away? We don't know. But here's what we do know, they couldn't get to the door. So what do they do? They somehow get up on the roof and start hacking a hole in this roof. Well, how do you suppose the owner of the house felt about that? All of a sudden, here's five people, counting the paralytic. Now, obviously, he's not helping with the hacking, but he's there. And they're hacking a hole in your roof. How are you going to feel about that? Probably not going to like it. Now, these four guys, what if you're the one doing the chopping? You're cl you've come up on somebody's roof, and now you're going to chop a hole in it. Well, what if he's got a room full of guns like I do? <laughs> you know? He just might be really ticked off. These guys had to have some kind of faith, some kind of devotion to this paralytic, faith to Je in Jesus, devotion to this paralyzed man, that they're literally, and, and we don't get this necessarily from the Scripture, but I think we can, we can see it, they're literally l risking their lives to get this guy to Jesus. Question. Is there someone, other than your spouse and your kids, someone that you care enough about that you would literally risk your, risk your life to help them move towards Jesus? I don't know. But I hope so. And I hope there's someone or some ones that would feel the same way about you. Because we need people like that in our lives. So these guys are up there hacking away at the, at the, the roof and they get this hole in there and somehow the owner doesn't shoot them. They, they lucked out there and they, they uh, lower this guy down. And, and let's see what happens. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Oh my goodness, did he drop a bombshell. There's nothing he could have said. There's no four-letter word he could have used that was going to get more negative reaction than saying to this young man, your sins are forgiven. Because... Well, let's, let's, look, let's just look at the reaction here. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, every once in a while, you run into some folks that are not really Christians, but claim to be, and they will say things like, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Right there he did. Because who can forgive sins but God himself? Now, a word about this term Messiah. When we say Messiah, we're talking about Jesus Christ, God incarnate, right? That's a strictly Christian concept. That's not a Jewish concept of the Messiah at all. In, the, in Judaism, the Messiah is in no way, shape, or form God. Let me read this for you. Very enlightening. This is out of some, of the, some Jewish literature. The Messiah will be a great political leader descended from King David. The Messiah is often referred to as Messiah ben David, which means Messiah son of, God, son of David. He will be well versed in Jewish law and observant of its commandments. He will be a charismatic leader inspiring others to follow his example. He will be a great military leader who will win battles for Israel. He will be a great judge who makes righteous decisions, but above all, he will be a human being, not a god, demigod, or other supernatural being. So Jesus 
could go about and call himself the Messiah and the Jews, the scribes, would think to themselves, yeah, well, we'll see. So far you don't look much like a Messiah, but maybe you will be. But as soon as he said to that paralytic, your sins are forgiven, he's saying, I am God. Because only God can forgive sins. And that's what set the Pharisees off. And blasphemy, by the way, was punishable by death. So that's a big deal. And Jesus really set off a firestorm when he said that. He did the unexpected. Now, did he have to say that in order to heal the, the paralytic? He didn't say that to the leper, did he? He just healed the leper. No. He was drawing his line in the sand with Judaism. He's saying, I'm here, I'm God, I can forgive sin. Jesus doesn't just do this once, by the way. In uh, John uh, chapter 8, verses uh, 58 and 59, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, what? I am. Now, when Moses was conversing with God and God was telling him to go to Pharaoh, and uh, Moses says to God, you know, he's coming up with all the objections, just like you and I do, when God wants us to do something we don't really want to do. And he says, well, I'm going to go to these people, and uh, they're not going to want to follow me. Who shall I tell them sent me? And you remember God's response. I am that I am. And Jesus uses the same words right here. He says, before Abraham was, I am. So he's claiming, again, to be God. Now, we may not see such a strong connection, but look at the response. So they picked up stones to throw at him. They were going to stone him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. One more place. John chapter 10, verses 30 and 31 the Father and I are one. And, and in the, again, in the Greek construction and the grammar, that, that means one and the same essence, the same being, the, the same everything about them is the same. He's not only claiming equality with God, he's claiming to be God. And again, look at the response. The Jews picks up stones again to stone him. Jesus is doing the unexpected here. Nobody expected him to be God. They expected him to be a lot of things, but not God. And now he's saying to them, I am. Let's take another peek at the characteristics of his healing. We looked at that last week a little bit too. When he speaks to this paralytic, says, your sins are forgiven. In verses uh, 11 and 12. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and, this is our favorite word in Mark, right? Immediately. He arose and immediately picked up his bed and went on his way. Again, no big fanfare, no huge prayer meeting, no jumping up and down, turning around three times or whatever it is. He simply says, your sins are forgiven, pick up your bed and walk. And immediately the paralytic gets up, tucks his bed under his arm and goes on his merry way. Now you think about that. This guy has been paralyzed his whole life. Shouldn't there be some rehab here necessary? I mean, shouldn't he have to go over here to rebound and uh, go through, a, learn how to walk and all that stuff because those, those muscles are all atrophied and not working? Not when Jesus heals. When Jesus heals, it's done. Pick up your bed and go home. Have a good life. And he does. 
Now, does Jesus still heal like that today? Sometimes. Sometimes he does. But remember, when Jesus heals, that's what he does. He doesn't do a halfway job. It's done. And you notice now, it doesn't tell us anything, again, about the four guys. They just disappear off the radar screen. And I don't know of anywhere where the paralytic shows up again in the New Testament. He's gone. Because the point, again, isn't the paralytic. It isn't the four guys. There's things we learn from all of them. The point is, Jesus Christ is God. He is the Christian idea of Messiah. And it's the same with our sins. When he forgives our sins, that they're gone. We don't have to do penance. And we don't have to spend a little time in purgatory because we didn't quite measure up. It's done. It's gone. It's 100%. And that's good for us to know. Okay, so we, we've, we've got the paralytic healed. Now he's going to do something else. In verses 13 through 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in Matthew's house. Now it's important we know that. because in, in, the, in the text it says, He reclined at table in his house. Okay. Now, we, if we don't want to go through the, the grammar there, we could say, well, maybe that's Jesus' house. No, he's in Matthew's house, and that's going to be important. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came, to call, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, Jesus has proven that he is God in the case of physical illness with the paralytic. Now he's showing that he is God in the case of social illness. Jesus has amazed and offended the religious leaders by touching the leper last week. You remember, he broke the law because a clean person was not supposed to come within uh, 50 steps of an unclean person. So Jesus, as we, as we mentioned before, uh, though the time of picking the grain on the Sabbath gets all the press, he actually broke the law before that when he touched that leper. Now he's going to amaze them again by not only touching, but actually befriending the socially unclean, which would have been Matthew. And as you can see, the Pharisees don't get it. Now to understand, we, we have to, to know a little bit about what's going on here. How many of you really like the tax collector in your life? You know, every quarter I have to write a check and send off my estimated quarterly taxes. And you know, maybe I should, maybe it's a lack of spiritual maturity, but I never pray over that check and say, Lord, please bless the recipient of this check. It, it just doesn't dawn on me to do that. Okay? But I don't hate the tax collector. You have to understand... During the Roman occupation of Israel, the most hated people in the land weren't the Romans. They held second place. The most hated people in the land were the tax collectors because the tax collectors were Jews. And the way the system worked, now you'll love this, you think the IRS is bad. They had a system, they called it the farm system. Now what you would do is, if you wanted to be a tax collector, you would bid on a certain area. In this case, Capernaum. And we know that Capernaum was a very wealthy area. A lot of commerce, a lot of trade. Uh, the, the road called the VMRs runs through there and it's still there today. And a very heavily traveled route. And so you would bid on it. And if you got it, the Romans would say to you, okay, 
you are now the tax collector for Camas and Washubel. And we want $20 million a year in taxes. Now, whatever you can bring in over that, you get to keep. And we're going to give you a contingent of soldiers to help you. Well now, how do you suppose that worked out? You have your own people now, the Jewish tax collectors, using the hated occupation force to suck your money out of your pocket. And they were brutal about it. They didn't care if you had enough left to eat or not. Oh, that's kind of like ours, isn't it? But <laughs> and so people hated them. They were, they were in every way like the group they called the Kapos in, in World War II. I don't know if you're familiar with that term or not, but in, in the concentration camps where they, they were uh, annihilating the Jews and treating them so cruelly, uh, the, the camps were largely run by capos who were Jews that were willing to do the dirty work for the Nazis. That way they didn't have to tie up able-bodied fighting men doing administrative work and that sort of thing. And they were hated because they were traitors to their own people, to their own race. So that's the way they felt, the Jews felt about Matthew. Whether they were scribes or whether they were uh, just everyday citizens, they hated him with a passion. And so what does Jesus do? I mean, there were a lot of people that were likable. He could have picked. Nope. He goes, here's this unexpected thing again, he goes and finds the, the most socially repugnant, repelling person he can go to, and he says, hey, come on, follow me. And then he says, hey, by the way, we're going to go to your house, get, get a bunch of your repugnant, repulsive friends, invite them over, and we're going to have a party. We're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're going to get to know one another. Now he says over here, I'm God. And he says over here, I'm going to hang out with these guys. What? Because even if they acquiesced a little bit to the fact that he was God, the Jewish idea of God certainly would not allow, have allowed for him to be hanging out with tax collectors. What's going on? The Pharisees, as you might imagine, were incredulous. By the way, the term Pharisee in the Hebrew means separated ones. It means those who are so righteous that they don't want to be associated with just everyday people. So they're separate. They're above you guys. And so here, the God, supposedly, that they worship is associating with the very people they would never be seen with. And he not only talks to these people, he socializes with them. Man, talk about rocking the boat, doing the unexpected. Hey, he says, I'm God. Now look who I'm going to hang with. It's amazing. It, it, it's kind of, to me, like, Years ago, when Promise Keepers was a big deal, they had a <clears throat> uh, meeting in, in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, and it was just for pastors. And so I, I went to that, and I don't know how many were there, but there were thousands, you know, it was a big deal. And uh, somebody was speaking, don't remember who it was, but, but up on the stage, they had all of the speakers for the week, and they were guys like Swindoll and Coach McCartney and... You know, I don't remember, but all the big name guys. And the speaker was talking about uh, pornography, okay? And he says, you know, now this is all nothing but men there, okay? So he says, you know, if Jesus were to come back here right now, just show up, who do you think he would sit by? And then he turned around and he said, you think he'd sit by Chuck Swindoll? Uh, do you think he'd sit by R.C. Sproul? Do you think he'd sit by Billy Graham? And the guy says, no. He would go out there and he would sit by the one of you that is having the most struggle with pornography. And he'd put his arm around you and he'd say, I'm going to help you beat this thing. 
Timothy. That's the Jesus we see here, isn't it? Kind of brings it home for us, doesn't it? Because we get the idea, if we're struggling with some kind of sin, whatever it is, that if Jesus were to show up, he certainly wouldn't have anything to do with us. Don't we think that way? In, in, that, in that kind of our default setting? But just the opposite is true. As we look at what Jesus did here, people are more important than protocol. And healing your sin is more important than hobnobbing with the big guys. Well, what have we learned from this little time this morning? One thing I see that just jumps right out at me is nowhere are we told that either the paralytic or Matthew were seeking salvation or even seeking God. Is that anywhere in the text? No. What did the paralytic want? He wanted to be healed. See, he's a seeker in the only sense that there are seekers. As Romans tells us, there's no one seeks after God. No, not one. But people seek to have their felt needs met. So it's okay if we, we meet those needs. Nothing wrong with that. But we need to tell them about Jesus too. Because oftentimes that will be the venue that God uses to bring them into his presence. All the paralytic hoped to hear was, you're healed. Instead, he heard the greatest news, your sins are forgiven. Matthew, he was just getting on with his life. And other than being a hated outcast from most of society, he had a good life. He was a wealthy man. He had friends, so they were all hated too, but you know how it is. You can stay with your own little group there and you're okay. Yeah, he didn't, when Jesus walked by, Matthew didn't say, Hey, hey, Jesus, can I follow you? Not in the text anywhere, is it? No, Jesus said to Matthew, Hey, follow me. The thing these two have in common, they both obeyed Jesus. He told the paralytic, pick up your bed and walk. And the paralytic didn't say, well, uh, um, are you sure I can get up? And if I get up, are you sure I'm going to be able to pick? No, he got up, picked up his bed, and went his way. Matthew got out of the, up, followed Jesus. They both demonstrated great faith. Faith in Jesus' ability and faith in obedience to God's call. Follow me, is what he says to Matthew. And Matthew complied. While the call to faith was the same for both, how that faith would play out was very different. See, who would you rather be in this scenario? The paralytic? Or Matthew. I would much rather be the paralytic. Any day. Hands down. Because what did he tell the paralytic to do? He said, your sins are forgiven. Get up. Go home. And he went home and had a happy life. We never hear from him again. On the other hand, he says to Matthew, follow me. Matthew didn't exactly have a great cushy life, did he? And he ended up dead. He was killed. Here's the thing. Some of us are called into God's kingdom. We accept that call and he says, great. Pick up your bed and go home. In, in fact, in, in Thessalonians, we are told that it, part of living the Christian life is to live quietly, do your work, pay your taxes, and don't cause problems. And that's the paralytic. That's his life. And a lot of Christians, the majority of Christians, are called to that. But to some, he says, follow me in a way 
that means a higher level of commitment. What we just inducted Mike into. He's going to ask more of those guys. He's going to ask more of their minds, more of their hearts, more of their finances, more of their time. And sometimes it's hard. And sometimes you feel like you get killed in the process. But, when they meet on the other side, it's all good. So, wherever you are, if, if you're just called to go home and reflect the image of God in your life, tremendous. By doing that, you're being 100% obedient to God's call, and only you know as an individual what God has called you to. We're all called to reflect his image to those around us as best we can. Some of us are called to do more. Some of us are called to be worship leaders. And they're not very nice people, they're worship leaders. Steve told me I could not, under any circumstances, bring a tambourine in and do rhythm. I was crushed. But that's what God called him to do. Protect the church. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's a good thing. So, don't look at others and try to determine if you're living out what God has called you to do by what they're doing or by what they're not doing. Because he's called you to do whatever he's laid on your heart to be doing. And that's what you want to do. Whatever it is. Pray with me. Father, thank you that you are a God of the unexpected. That you are a God of the unusual. And the reason for that is because your thoughts are not our thoughts. Your ways aren't our ways and thank you so much for that. And Lord, we would just ask you this morning to so enlighten us Give us such clarity of the personal call you've laid on our hearts individually that we will fulfill that calling to the best of our ability, to the best of everything within us. And not be concerned with what you've called other people to do. Because when it's all said and done, it's between you and us individually. And Lord, I would pray this morning that you would lay it upon all of our hearts this coming week to do something unexpected that would reveal your presence in our lives to someone or some ones around us. And we ask this in your great and precious name, Jesus. Amen.